thank you for coming to our meeting. Not only the, with the noise, the air pollution, the airport hazards committee meets here in this building in a small room, of course, every month. On the, we try to on the third Thursday monthly. And we, at that time, we have an agenda, which we have a very, very brief one tonight. And we bring up issues that are already on the table, we've been working on over the past uh, <coughs> number of months or weeks, whatever. And as I say, then we go off on our assignments. But in any event, uh, I guess what I first should do right off the bat before anything is introduced, those members were kind of short today. But one of our newer members, uh, Julia Wallace, she's out of town uh, today, uh, Don just told me. But I'll start over here with Don Clerk. She works for the EPA. She's a newer member of the committee. But going back to my left here, you can look at Murderers Road, the old cut timers. I've got them all over here, okay? I'm Dick Bad, currently the chairman of the committee. Next to me is Jerry Fellow, who you all know. Um, he has been on this committee a lot. I'll give you a little background on him in a minute. Next to him is Dave Phipps. Dave is a retired Air Force jockey. Jet jockey went to work, retired from USA. And last, well, Dick, right now, John has changed places with me in a minute. And other members of the committee out here tonight is Aaron Murray, uh, Julia Wallace, as I said. Barbara Bishop is a member ex officio of, uh, let me put it this way, she represents Representative Mr. Leo. And I, I'll give you a little background on that in a minute. But anyway, Barbara is the member of the committee. She's out there making sure that I'm running smooth tonight. Okay, so this committee was formed back in 1971. For those that may not have been with us before. By the way, as I said, we meet generally every Thursday except during the summer. We'll either meet during the summer for an issue of rises. However, the, the, the third Thursday of the month we meet down here to go over these things. And the committee, like I say, was formed in 1971 by both of the town meeting with the selectmen on it to appoint seven members to this new committee. If you recall about that time, which is when the Gen Age really hit Boston, the airport started to expand back in late 40s into the 50s when they took Governor's Island, started the new runways, things of that nature, really expanding. And that was, that's the day when Anna DeFronzo gathered a group of women up in East Boston who were known eventually as the Maverick Street Mothers. And with all the trucks and all the goings on at the airport, all the Maverick Street Mothers were out there with their baby carriage, their trucks will not go through well. You know what happened? The airport was finally built not because Anna and her gang didn't give it their best. But in 1971, like I say, we hit our stride here in the area for the jet traffic. And that's the era, if you can recall back from the 727s, were a big hit in the airlines. Although there was a new, bigger, better airplanes, mm -hmm. and all three manufacturers had new aircraft. Uh, Boeing had the 727, Douglas built the DC-10, and uh, the other one, Lockheed 1011. That's the airplane that had three engines on the rear of the airplane, one on either side and one up under the tail. And those engines did not keep pace with the design and the uh, uh, capacity of the airlines because the engines were horrible. Noisy, smelly, spewed out uh, unspent fuel from the rear of the vehicles. Remember the black on trails we used to see going up? It was terrible. And that's when the town meeting here in Winter said, we better get involved in this. They're ruining not only our at the town, but the atmosphere. So the committee was reported, was appointed. The selectmen at that time decided, well, they said seven of them, so the three of them decided to appoint themselves plus four others. One of the four others, Bob Driscoll, next to Jerry Falvo on my left down here. Bob has been here for 48 years battling over the airport in one form or another. We refer to him as the dean of our committee. Right next to me is Jerry Falvo, who was a up to do Jerry during the committee, and that committee was appointed a few years later. Another 40 year guy. I'm a new kid, I've only been around 25 years on this committee, but the last one on the end of the table, not Don, but Dave Phipps, as I said, Air Force, and then USA, and he's been with us now for a number of years. These other folks just couldn't make it for one reason or another. We invited the town council. I don't see any councils of the president here. We invited the board of health tonight because I know you're all anxious to hear from Dick Professor Hersey, who has a proposal for us. I don't know what the proposal is either, but we're going to hear Don's going to introduce a little later on. But that's the background on the committee. So at this point in time, I think on my agenda, I had two items listed. 
One that Jerry uh, found with Jerry, the vice chairman of this committee, but he's also the vice chairman of the latest form committee known as Massport CAC, Community Active Group, okay, Community Activity Group. And that composed, composed of a number of cities and towns uh, expanded to include uh, places we never were represented before in this area. Places going up to Malden, Medford, Arlington, Bedford, Lexington. Uh, to the west of Boston, more than oh, out oh, that way, and even more communities to the south. I think one of the communities even going number is Ipswich, which is on that community. Yes. Yes. But anyway, and uh, there, if that particular committee was formed uh, with agreement for mass work by the legislature, oh, and they appropriated money to be able to fund that group no, of no, independently, and uh, that's why, as I say, the cherry, long time ago. Uh, so I, before I go any further, I would like to have called on Jerry for his latest report. I think there was a CAC meeting last week, Jerry, and do you have any data that you can read it to the committee? And you can tell the folks here what's here tonight. Yeah. Come on up here. Shh. Don't trip on the cables, Jerry. Well, certainly I would. I got a note that I got to drop in. Make it. Dan, you're being picked up here. My voice is uh, failing me. Um, I want to just uh, start off very quickly by saying this. Dick has done one hell of a painting of job to help us maintain the stability of this committee and also to take care of the, the bountiful or constant minuscule details that the chairman has to take on when he is running an organization. Uh, I'm going to try to speak very briefly. Are you almost ready, Sam? Yeah, go for it. I, I could use a minute, but not much time. All right. So. <laughs> All right. Uh, the volume is there, Jerry. I don't know if you can adjust it on the top on the up on the console. Boy, you, you can't hear me? No, no I'm just saying. Can, you know, can, you can you hear me? Yeah. <laughs> okay. It's bad enough. Uh, <clears throat> all right, uh, let, let me bring you up to date very quickly. The, the state organization that, that they referred to is an organization that had its humbling, be, humble beginnings back about 15 years ago when Massport agreed to form an advisory committee, but they have allocated us $20,000 $20, a year. That never got off the ground obvious reasons that wasn't going to help us. Finally, through the efforts of Speaker DeLeo, as the years went on, culminating in uh, June of 2013, they established the committee that they referred to the CAC. The CAC consists of representatives from 30 towns, and it has 40 members. The reason for that disparity is the city of Boston is represented by six members for the various degrees. Now, <clears throat> as you can imagine, it's such a diverse group that we don't always agree on the same issues, particularly with regards to overflights and ground noise. <clears throat> However, they're a bunch of good people, honest and sincere, and they want to do something to help their communities. One of the things that I'm concerned about is we here in Winter understand that at times soft words do not get us anywhere with Mansport, yeah. and that has happened for many years. The problem I'm having with our committee, these nice people, they feel that it's better to approach this with honey, despite the fact that the Mass Board may not respond for months on issues. I'm hoping that we can take care of that. <coughs> Administratively, we have a lot of work to do. That's why it took us so many years, 2013. One of the biggest problems that I think we've solved now is to get a capable, competent executive director. 
Pat Berman, who was the man that we're going to hire, and we'll hire him at a salary of 120000 a year, which some me digress, I'm going to go back to the funding. When we finally got successful legislation, which we agreed to in 2013, we received $250,000. That was for us to get each and every year. We obviously wanted $500,000 because we felt for the, to pay for the executive director and the other individual who were going to need it. Uh, so the compromise was that for fiscal 2019, $250,000 will jump to three hundred, dollars and, and it will go up $50,000 each year until we reach the maximum of $500,000 in the year, well, five years from now, anyway. Um, there, there is so much to tell you, but I don't want to interfere on Scott's because he has something very important. One last thing that I'll, I'll tell you about this, and by the way, if anybody has any questions after the professor puts on his performance, I'll gladly accept any questions you have. To me right now, the most damaging what could be the most damaging thing in our relationship with Passport is the so-called Memorandum of Understanding. I, I, <coughs> excuse me, I read it yesterday. If we were to agree on each and every paragraph, you might as well call with CAC Advisory Board as a subdivision of Passport, not the independent advisory committee that we hold ourselves up to. That's going to be the basis of a big dispute, and that will be coming up. Oh, I'll tell you something cute that Massport did that comes to this point. When they finally agreed to go with the new button, the new funding, 50 <coughs> there was a caveat at the end, and it said, Massport CAC, must adhere to the rules and regulations of Massport. I don't know what legislator got that in. Certainly it wasn't Bob. But, but that particular caveat is going to cause us problems. Thank you very much. Again, accept that question. So as I 
you say, and I wanted to say, Ms. Casella, is that after your call last week, I had a call from a person here in Windsor whose husband was both associated in the past with the FAA and Logan. And she called the other day. There was an aircraft out on 927, which is the runway that goes over uh, the playground down on the beach, rubbing an engine, rubbing it. And she called to complain about it. And the young fellow that answered the phone to the noise abatement office, he said, well, you know, they have to rub the engine when they're getting ready to take off. She said, for half an hour? Obviously, there was an engine problem. They were out there checking an engine and all. So you got to call on that, too. Please be courteous to Windsor presidents. We're here. We get knowing we want action on them. And we want to report when some of these things happen. So that one is real. Now, you probably also wonder, what else do we do in our spare time? Well, what we recently have been working on is Logan put into Expand Terminal E. That's the international terminal. And they need an approval to change three of the gates. You know, we're getting bigger and larger, both domestic and foreign airplanes landing. They needed more space. So they got the OK to enlarge three gates over Terminal E. And uh, unfortunately, now they want 10 more. They're going to expand Terminal E all the way up there, or quite a way up Frontage Road there. And there's a design out. There's been no approvals yet. I mean, they can build them. There's no question it's on their property. But the thing is, we're waiting to see if we're going to be critique on the design of this, what it's going to look like. Uh, but they say we need this even if, without the international. The international travel is picked up significantly, and which means more noise, more traffic, of course. And uh, what they want to do is, uh, as they say, when they get through, I think they're going to have a total of 17 gates over there. That would be a pretty good facility, okay? So we were, we've been going, writing her number for that. The next thing down the line, they said, we need more public parking. So they wanted to raise the limit that was set on by the state years ago, 5,000 more cars. Oh boy. Well, we have two sites. Down beyond the state police barracks, as you know, on frontage roads, there's a garage there. We'll add to that. Okay. And then, when I say okay, that's what they propose. Then the other place, outside of Terminal E, across the street, there's an open parking lot existing. We'll build the other parking lot right there. And that's right on the airport property and all. Well. We, we appeared, the committee here, there were several of us went up to that hearing uh, before the Department of Environmental Protection here in Massachusetts. Freddie Salabucci spoke, former Secretary of Transportation. Good performance. Hearing from East Boston, their group spoke. Uh, we were, uh, because I don't know how many of you commute days, but getting out of winter in the morning uh, is no bargain, is it? Getting back in the afternoon sometimes is no bargain. The three, the three tunnels are jammed sometimes. And you know, more cars, that means more exhaust, more traffic jams. So we battle for that. Well, they got the tacit approval, provided they met certain criteria set by the Conservation Law Foundation, who have been in the paper recently for being, uh, they were not for a couple of other agreements they made. But again, all subject to something. Ironically, some of these locals says, we really got to put the parking on the back window right now. You know why? Uh, Luft and the other, uh, what do you call it, the other pickup company? Uber. 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 <laughs> the people are taking that. But that doesn't solve the problem. We're still, East Boston streets are loaded. The tunnels are loaded. Everything is loaded. There's still exhaust going back and forth. So again, the parking group can help. We just don't know what's going to happen now. And um, so that's what we were working on those. We, we go to all those hearings. We're heard. Uh, we don't uh, let them get away with anything that we, we try anyway on our part. So we can terminate the public parking, and uh, of course now they're talking about uh, when they do that terminal E, they were talking about connection to the E, to the green, uh, blue line rather. We'll have to see what that's all about. So we'll have to go on with that. So the other problem that we come up with, come right back to, is one on the health study. Now the health study we received done by the Commonwealth of Massachusetts over 10 years, off again, on again, off again, on again. Representative DeLeo to trying to get money to get the health study done. They did a, did a health study, then they sent it out for about a year and a half for a peer review. We got it in 2014. It was 10 years old. You know how valid it is today, not worth a dime. And one of the big parts of that, which we found out, there, we, and it comes right down to basics, 
is there's still aircraft using Lohman Airport to burn air gas, not jet fuel, air gas. Okay? That's hot stuff. Okay? And they're full of lead. They need the lead and aviation gas, especially commercial and military, for the power. Otherwise, you get, uh, you get what do you call it, backfires on engine. Can't have that with aircraft that are surfacing. So, uh, you know, that, that for a whole new puts on it. Now, Cape Air is the airline that's flying those airplanes. They've ordered some new ones that can burn regular gasoline, but it'll still be uh, lead of gas, but a lot lower. But you know, just this week, I think, I don't know how many of you probably got the same pamphlet came out from MWRA, and they're stressing get rid of the lead, get rid of the pipes, and things of that nature, have them replaced. They're doing a great job. The town has done a great job. And now, all of a sudden, that health study comes out, and what they did with the health study, they found out what it wasn't so bad off. What do you mean? Well, they took the data and divided it by 17 communities. <laughs> The close cities and the further out communities. Well, what does that tell us? Nothing, okay? Sure, it looks great on paper when you divide it, but let's just, just take that same data and divide it by Winter, Revere, Chelsea, South Boston, Quincy, where the aircraft are coming and landing all the time. Then let's see what they meant. That wasn't what was the report. So we're very dissatisfied with that, and we're still hoping we can get something going on now. So that's what we've been doing in the recent past, and uh, uh, we have three new members, including the young lady I'm going to introduce next to her, the professor. But uh, as they say, uh, we're working, and we can all wish you was more help on our committee. Because we come up with ideas, especially our new Cracker Jack, like the young one at the end of the table. Oh, well, why don't we do this? Okay, you know. But uh, we need people to take assignments and go out and do some of this work. Well, without any further ado, without delaying the meeting anymore, I want to introduce Don Quirk. She lives down the point. And she's going to have a contact initial contact with the professor and what led us up to tonight. And Don, the floor is yours. That's the way. Thank you, Dick. Hi. Um, thanks, everybody, for coming. Uh, my name is Don Quirk. I live in down Point Shirley, and um, I was fortunate to meet Professor Scott Hersey last fall, um, along with um, Tufts University, who, who performed some air monitoring in my driveway, um, and, and that's what you'll hear about tonight. But let me, um, you know, tell you a lot about um, the, the professor. Our guest of honor is Dr. Scott Hersey. He's a professor of chemical and environmental engineering at Olin College in Needham, Mass. Um, his research and teaching interests are at the interaction between human populations and the environment with a focus on human-caused air pollution and its impact on health, meteorology, and global climate. One of his true passions is working with communities to help them fully realize their unique potential. Olin College's curriculum is built around hands-on engineering and design projects. This project-based teaching begins in a student's first year and culminates in two senior capstone projects. In the engineering capstone, teams are hired by corporations, nonprofits, or entrepreneurial ventures for real-world engineering projects. Scott's prior experience um, was working in South Africa with governments, communities, and industry stakeholders to develop effective offset programs for improving air quality. He was also an assistant uh, professor in both engineering and chemistry at Harvey Mudd College in California. He has two undergraduate degrees from Rice University in Texas, Ecology and Evolutionary Biology and Civil and Environmental Engineering, and he has his Master's and PhD in Environmental Science and Engineering from Caltech, and his PhD dissertation focused on the chemical composition of aerosol particles and their impact on urban air quality, cloud microphysics, and climate. Please give a warm welcome to Scott Hersey. So as Don mentioned, I'm, I'm a professor at Olin College of Engineering. My title is Chemical and Environmental Engineering, but I, I really kind of sit at the intersection of engineering and science, and then also community development. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit more about my story as I get going. And we'll make sure everybody has a chance to get over there. There's nothing super important in the first couple slides, so you can take it. And forgive me, I, I came out on the cold two days ago, which became a cold with a fever. 
last night. So I, I, if I am a little bit difficult to understand, sorry. <laughs> I'm going to do my best. All right. Can you take the microphone, sir? Just show me. Uh, you want me to hold it? Just hold it down. Yeah. I can hold it. Yeah. Maybe put it, yeah, take it right off. Yeah. Just lift it up. Yeah. It seems like it's, yeah. it's okay. Oh, I see. There you go. I'll, uh, yeah, I'll, okay. I'll do right. this. Thank So I, I today, it's a little bit of a, so all the titles are going to be on the slanted roof, apparently. Hand up here. Hand it down from here. Oh, no, this is great. Okay, no, all right. I just want to see. So today I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you a little bit about uh, my, myself and our team that's working on, on East Boston and with roof related air quality. So I'll just do a little bit of an introduction so you know what we're about, because I plan on being here for a while and being connected with you all as a community. So I want you guys to get to know me a little bit. Uh, I want to tell you a little bit about why we're here. What, what are we actually concerned with in East Boston and Winthrop? And why are we interested in working with you all and coming to things like town council meetings and report hazards committee meetings? So I'll tell you a little bit about that. And then I, I'll tell you a little about some preliminary results from some data collection that we did at Don and Chris's house. I didn't mean to exclude you, Chris, but I didn't know you would be here. <laughs> um, so I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about data that we collected last summer and, and focus really on the, the key takeaways from that data set as a whole and how that relates to work that we're going to initiate starting, really starting now um, and continuing through the next academic year and, and hopefully for much longer than that. I'll tell you a little bit about the recent Massport report that came out that had some environmental hazards stuff in it and my, my read on that. And, where I think there are good things in it and where there are, are some glaring holes that are, you know, it's, it's not necessarily Massport's fault, but it's the fault of the system that they're operating in. And uh, then I want to tell you a little about a new air quality monitoring network that my students and I are going to be setting up uh, starting this summer that will help to fill some of those gaps. So that's where we're headed. Uh, I'm planning on only talking at you for about 30 minutes. So. That's the gauge of time, and then uh, I'll take any kind of question, and we want to get feedback from you all, too. So, so our team is, uh, so I'm, I'm there in the middle, you know a little bit about me. Um, this is Evan, Evan Cross. Uh, Evan Cross is a, a good friend of mine and a, a colleague and research collaborator. He works at Aerodyne Research, Inc. And the two logos up here, there's Olin College is the O, and then Aerodyne is that uh, funky line with the aircraft and the boat. So Aerodyne, they make uh, these fantastic air quality monitoring instruments, these very sophisticated instruments that measure chemical composition of particulate matter, which is really important in assessing things like the environmental health impact, and then also things like the sources and the chemistry that led those things to be what they are, where they are. And then this is Christine at the far end. Uh, who in that picture is actually looking up at an airplane, so it's very fitting. And Christine's here running the slides for me. Uh, Christine has been a student of mine for the last three years at Olin and just graduated, but I roped her into coming back and helping me out with this project through the summer. So thanks for being here. There's another group of five students who we don't know who they are yet uh, that will be joining the team on September 5th. Uh, we start our new capstone project that is going to be a year-long project and we launch it on September 5th so you're going to get a whole new team of five students that is going to be here in Winthrop in East Boston uh, doing some of the research and, and setting up this monitoring network. We're all here, this is a little bit difficult to read because it's a, a little bit of a glare but I'll, I'll talk you through it. All of us on that team are here because we care about the actual health impacts of degraded air quality on real people. That's what motivates us to do the research that we're doing. And some of those health impacts that you're probably familiar with, uh, exposure to degraded air quality is related to childhood asthma, increased incidence of childhood asthma, to increased risk of cardiovascular disease in all ages, but especially expressed in uh, older populations. Also, lower IQ and school performance. Uh, so there have been a number of studies linking school performance and general intellectual aptitude to exposure to uh, poor air quality. And that's even after uh, adjusting for socioeconomic status and 
access to different types of uh, different types of resources that might be available based on air quality. And the last thing is is increasingly we're finding that uh, certain types of pollution are related to neurological disorders. So they are associated with early onset Alzheimer's and, and uh, maybe an environmental trigger for some of those disorders. So there's there's a lot of health impacts. Uh, I, I don't say that to, to scare you all. I say that because like, there are real problems, and if you're consistently exposed to degraded air quality, you're at higher risk for these things, and, and this is what we are after uh, addressing with our research. A little bit about my own story, just so you know that that community development piece is, is kind of a unique one, right? So as Don said, I, I spent my PhD and master's at Caltech, and that picture up at the top is uh, my research team and I sitting outside an, an aircraft, and that aircraft is packed full of about $10 million worth of instruments, and we fly it around a polluted area for about a month at a time, and the total cost of that is somewhere on the order of like $100,000 a day to do studies like that. So we had all these tools available to us. Because it's so expensive, only the most privileged countries and areas of countries have access to that type of information. After I finished at Caltech, I moved to South Africa for three years, and I lived in a township that looked a lot like that one. And I, I did community-based development work um, with this super awesome community of people that was just interested in transforming their <coughs> local neighborhood. Um, and I studied air pollution models there, too. And there's not $100,000 on the continent of Africa to study air pollution. And we're spending that every day at Caltech to, to do some of these studies. So, I got really interested in, in pragmatic, low-cost ways to do direct community intervention that improved people's air quality and reduced their exposure to harmful pollutants. So direct community impact is, is what I'm about my research. Um, and you can go to the next one. So this is a, a I'm, gonna, I'm not going to spend much time on this because this is still kind of half-baked in my own head. Uh, but generally, my research, well, let me tell you about the research process in general. Uh, typically, with a research process, you've got some big government agency that awards funds, uh, and then there's, they award it to some scientists who do a study. The scientists do the study, they publish it, and then it ends up in a, in a bookshelf of sorts, or a web bookshelf, and, and it's increased the body of knowledge about a particular it's good. We need to know more about these problems. We need to know more, more about the science and the engineering. That cycle continues. There's a big thick arrow that goes back to funding award. And you apply for more funding, and you do that over and over and over. And the typical academic's career is entirely focused, and you, you get incentivized for publishing more and, and doing more, going around that cycle more. Um, eventually, you you get some kind of signal that is clear enough to act on. So the EPA, for example, says it looks like particulate matter is really dangerous for people's health, so we are going to do something to regulate it. So then there's a tiny little arrow that says it's clear enough to act, and then it goes into some regulatory cycle. It takes decades to go around that cycle before anyone is, is likely to do much about it. And then once it gets in this regulatory cycle, it's likely to take another five to ten years before any regulation actually happens. You, know, when it, you got committees involved, you got politicians involved, there's lobbyists involved, so it's, a, it's kind of a big mess of voices that are leading to that. Eventually, you get some legislation uh, that usually is delayed implementation uh, that lobbyists sort of uh, advocate for so the industry has time to respond. And then once that gets implemented, you start to get into health so you have less of those emissions and people are, are healthier. Um, this part down here is super important because this is, these are like <coughs> systemic changes. This is, this is stuff like uh, outlawing an internal combustion engine. We'll eventually have to go through that type of cycle. These are good, big changes that may need to happen, but it's going to take a long time. My research is... My research is focused on an on a adjacent cycle that is community-initiated. So 
If your goal is to expand the body of knowledge, then that cycle at the top is really good and it's effective. My personal goal from just my own motivations and my experience in South Africa is that I want to get to that healthier community part as quickly as possible. I'm not satisfied to go through all these cycles for, for 10 or 15 years. I want to see things happen very quickly. So, so my proposal, and, and the reason that I'm here with you as a community, is that I, I believe that an engaged community that's working with scientists can access the existing body of knowledge and not wait for it to trickle out in the clear enough to act cycle. I think that we can access that body of knowledge. I can, I can tell you uh, without any question whatsoever that things like ultrafine particles, uh, it's the smallest subset of particulate matter, are actually what's making people the sickest. There's no regulation for that yet, and it's gonna take a long time for there to be any regulation on it. But you all, equipped with the knowledge that ultrafine particles are dangerous, can do your own studies to see what, what are the ultrafine particle characteristics in Winthrop, in East Boston, and you can develop your own set of localized knowledge that then you can immediately act on. You can do things like installing HEPA filters. You can do things like uh, doing an air quality survey of your home and seeing how leaky your windows and doors are to see if you can seal them up and prevent those from coming in the first place. So my work is all focused on that community-engaged stuff, so the development of the local knowledge and then also the coming up with the direct action strategies to help you be healthier now before all of that other stuff happens. So that's what I'm about. The first little bit of that was starting to get a little bit of background knowledge uh, from Dom and Chris's house. So we, I worked with some collaborators at Tufts and we filled a van full of some instruments and we took it out and we parked it in a driveway for was like a, was it only about a month? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thanks for that. It was about a month. We were we had posed on them for about a month and had power. <coughs> and we we measured par, uh, meteorology, we measured particulate matter, so total particle concentrations and then the size distributions of those particles, and then some gas phase pollutants. Um, and I'm gonna show you little bit of context of where Don and Chris's place is uh, after this. So our, our key question was how do Logan impacts vary with meteorology and activity? So wind is changing all the time, weather is changing all the time, uh, Logan activity is changing all the time. We wanted to see at Don and Chris's house how does that shift? Um, how does that shift the air quality impact of the experience there? And there's some sub bullets there. So like for example, can you see a signature from a single aircraft landing over their house? Do you, do you see an impact from a single landing event? How do uh, those impacts from single events differ from wind just blowing Logan ground-based pollution to their house? And then how do those change with time of meteorology? So those were really the questions that we were after. For those of you who don't know where Don lives, it's roughly where that star is right there. Um, if, if you're familiar with Logan runways, the, the runway that basically points right at their house is 27-9. Uh, so when aircraft are landing on 27, they land basically right over a house at low altitude. And then when they're taking off on 9, they're at higher altitude, higher thrust, uh, leaving the place. When, uh, yeah, those are the operating configurations, they'll be hard to see, but uh, this, the predominant wind in the summer when we were there was southwest and west. So we also had a lot of time when wind was blowing pollution from Logan over to their house. So we got to see all three of those. We got to see the takeoff events, the landing events, and just the general background pollution. So it, was a, it ended up being a great site for us. And we'll follow up on that because we want to come again. <laughs> all right. Go ahead. So rather than show you a data slide, I am going to show you a data slide, uh, but I'm going to start with a video. And what you're going to see in this video is there's going to be an aircraft that flies over the screen. It's an Airbus A190. It's not a particularly large aircraft. It's pretty new. And it's about to land at Logan. As soon as it passes by, I'm going to pan my phone inside the van and show you the readout from one instrument. And that one instrument is called a CPC, or Condensation Particle Counter. All that thing does 
is it draws in air and it counts all the particles that it sees. So the output of it is the number of particles per volume of air. And the volume in this case is a cubic centimeter, which is about that big. It's pretty small. Uh, so what you're going to see is there's a background of about 50,000 particles per cubic centimeter, and then it increases a lot when that aircraft goes by after about 40 seconds. So I'm going to have Christine play on the video. So there goes the aircraft. It's not directly over Don and Chris's house, but it's within a few hundred meters of that center line. And then we're going to wait for about 30 seconds. So that y-axis there is the concentration, and the x-axis is time. So you can see that it takes a little bit of time for that plume from the aircraft to hit where we're sampling. And then you'll see the increase in particle concentration when the plume hits. So raise your hand when you think the plume hit. And you'll actually see that the y-axis had to, had to shift its scale because it went off the y-axis. So that, that peaked at about 300,000 particles per cubic centimeter. So that's um, six to 10 times what the background was. Uh, just to put that in perspective, that's on the order of being in a really smoky bar uh, or being in an enclosed room that has some incense sticks and candles going. And that happened every single time an aircraft landed over your house. Um, so the next slide is going to have some data on it. If it'll let you advance. Oh, I know it's not. I'm going to tell you why that plume exists. <laughs> um, so if you think about an aircraft, it's flying in a direction. It's also staying aloft, right? So in, in physics, we, we have students make force diagrams. So there's some force going that way to make it go forward. And there's some force going that way to keep it up. Right? So that means that you have to thrust back. And you have to create some kind of force downward to push the thing up. Right? So that thrust backward is, is making the aircraft go forward. That thrust downward is from the air uh, circulating over the wings. And that's what creates the lift. So what happens is that jet engine creates emissions that then get forced downward by the, by the wing motion. There have been a, uh, a number of people that have studied the fluid dynamics of that downward force. In fact, one of the experts is, is another colleague at Aerodynamic uh, who we work with. And it turns out that that downward downwash is on the order of 100 meters to 300 meters deep. So what that means is if, if you have an aircraft that's within about a couple hundred meters above you, you're getting downwash from those jet engines. Right? So this should be next slide. This totally doesn't show up, but it's a, it's a map of the Logan airspace. And you can go to the Massport website and you can see the Logan airspace. And one feature that you can see in it is that the airspace extends to really low altitudes on all the approach paths. And that happens over particular swaths of East Boston and Winthrop. Uh, and that's when you have that downwash that forces all those particles to the ground. And, uh, I'm going to use a dramatic word, and I don't mean it so dramatically, but it, it fumigates that, that area. Um, so here's the science slide, and I'm going to talk you through it and, and talk you through the high-level takeaways. What we're showing here, that top panel, is data from a really expensive instrument called a, a, an SMPS. Costs about hundred thousand dollars, and it, all it measures is the particle size distribution. So, what's the concentration of particles at different sizes? So, on the y-axis up there is the size of the particle, going from six nanometers up to two hundred nanometers. So, this is all really small, really small particles. That color scale that you see is the concentration. So, where it's red, you're getting up to about two million particles per cubic centimeter. What I just showed you in the video was about two hundred thousand. So uh, that's 10 times more particles than I just showed you in the video. And then on the bottom, it's a really cheap instrument. Uh, it's an RECS. It's also made by Aerodyne. Uh, and Evan, who is, is on this team, he spearheaded the development of these low-cost instruments. And we had this running uh, 
and the van at the same time. And what I want to draw your attention to is that there are, there are three different regimes happening here. I'm going to call them regimes. So this is 16 hours worth of data. It starts in the middle of the night. It starts at uh, like 1 a.m. And you can see that up from 1 a.m. until about 5.30 a.m., there's not much air traffic. And we can verify this by going into the FAA database and seeing all the takeoff and landing events. So there's not much happening during that time, but wind is gradually blowing some of the Logan uh, ground traffic emissions in the direction of their house. Um, but it's pretty clean. You get a couple of spikes of carbon monoxide, which is this, this bottom axis. You see a couple of spikes of that, not many particles. And then at about 5.30 a.m., uh, Logan starts operating runway 9 for takeoffs. And wind is coming basically directly out of the west-northwest, which blows all of those ground emissions directly to their house. So what's happening is that every aircraft is thrusting, taking off directly over their house, and it's creating this plume of particles underneath it that then get blown to their house behind it. And so you can see that all of those red splotches are takeoff events, basically. And they get smeared a little bit because they have to get transported to their house over a few hundred meters, and it's like a half mile, something like that. At about 10.30, there's a switch. The winds shifted a little bit, and they start using runway 27, which is the same runway for landing <laughs> instead of takeoff. Then what you see is that the, the characteristics look a lot different. Particles end up being a lot smaller. And there are very sharp distinctions of every aircraft that landed over the top. If you look down at these low cost sensors, you start you see some of those peaks that correspond to some of the peaks up there. It's not a hundred percent, but you see a lot of the same peaks. And generally that CO instrument can tell between those two different regimes. So when, when there's takeoffs and you're getting all that Logan pollution, there's generally higher CO concentrations versus lower when it's used for landings, right? So what I want you to take away from all of this is that the dynamics of your exposure to air pollution totally depend on where you are. They depend on, on what the sources are and what those sources are doing. Are they taking off? Are they and then also, what is the wind bringing you? So it's this complex set of variables that determines how exposed you are to various types of pollution and the concentrations of pollution. The other takeaway from this is that these low-cost sensors that we operate actually do a pretty good job as a proxy for those really expensive measurements. So if you imagine the town of East Boston, or the town of Winthrop, who wants to really understand their impact from from Logan, it's not feasible to get 10 different instruments that cost $100,000 each. You're not going to be able to do that. But if you got an instrument that costs about $6,500, then you're talking, and you can actually, you can create a network to answer some of the questions that you have. We still have some questions. So one of those questions is, how do those dynamics evolve over the course of a year with different meteorology? different temperature with different chemistry happening based on temperature. The second question we still have is, do we see similar patterns in other locations? This was just at Don and Chris's house. Do we see this in other places? We, we're not sure. And then the third one is, what are air quality impact signatures from different Logan activities? So you have vehicles arriving on the ground. There's that, they've got a signature. You got takeoffs that have a signature. The landing has a signature. You have all these diesel vehicles that are running around on the tarmac that have a signature. Uh, so can we start to resolve between those? The, you got the Uber and Lyft waiting lot that's got a signature. So what are those different signatures, and can we distinguish them? <coughs> this leads to a bit of a question of like, what's Massport doing about this? <coughs> Has anybody seen this report, the Environmental Data Report? Just came out. Yeah. Yeah, it just came out. Uh, we've been through it. Christine has, has really been through it. And, and you're doing slides, so I'm just going to talk really quickly through it. That's right. um, this is an EPA-mandated report. Uh, MassForce is not doing this out of the goodness of their hearts. It is EPA-mandated. And, and because it's EPA-mandated, EPA mandates what they actually report. And 
if, if you take nothing else away from this part of the talk, it's that you, you recognize the EPA mandates that you report emissions and not air quality impacts. So Massport did its job when they put together a report that characterizes all of the emissions associated with Logan. Great. You can't read through that report and tell what that means for Winthrop. Mm -hmm. there's, a, there's a step that's missing there, because emissions have to get transported to a place. They have to mix in the air and become a concentration of pollution that you then breathe. There's chemistry that happens along the way. So there's, there's a gap between what they're reporting and what you can use to evaluate your impact. And, and that's not Massport's fault, actually. They're, they're doing what they're supposed to do. Um, but there's some important gaps that we would need to address. So a couple takeaways. Um, one is the aircraft and associated ground equipment are responsible for 90% of NOx emissions, so nitrogen and oxide is gas phase pollution, and about 80% of particulate matter. Uh, so aircraft is, is a big part of that. They've got some nice pie charts that uh, we totally should have shifted to the white one, but it's fine. It's not showing up particularly well, but you can look at all of the emissions on a pie chart and you can see uh, that for particulate matter, in terms of particulate matter mass, 63% is an aircraft, and then you've got equal amounts of motor vehicles coming into the airport and ground service equipment, something like that. So that's all good. Um, but again, it doesn't tell you anything about your impact on the road. So what are they not doing? They're not doing any ground-based monitoring. The only way that you can actually determine the impact in a community that's near source is to actually measure the pollution concentrations in that community. Right? Massport's not doing that. Um, and, and they have no requirement to do that. And so I think it'd be great if they did, uh, but it's, it's probably not that feasible. So that, that leaves us with a gap, and, and this is a gap that we have identified with people like yourselves. Uh, and as scientists, we recognize that's a pretty glaring hole in this whole system. So we want to do something to address that gap. So, uh, we have a project that's coming up uh, starting in the fall, and we're sort of doing a soft start this summer. And what I aim to do with my students, and this is a, a partnership between Olin College and Aerodyne Research is actually funding the vast majority of this. So they're, like, they deserve some huge, huge acknowledgement for the fact that they're making this happen. Uh, and then Air Inc., so our friends uh, Chris and Gail over at Air Inc., and everybody else who's involved with, with that they're helping fund this as well. And what we're gonna do is set up a sensor network in East Boston and Logan to actually do those distributed measurements around the local communities. So we wanna set up somewhere between eight and 12 instruments at strategic locations to consistently measure, permanently measure long-term air pollution in the area surrounding Logan. All of those data are gonna be real-time streamed to a database so there's, they're stored in a, a server somewhere in Ohio or something. And then the, the main part of the project that my students are going to work on is building this software ecosystem around those data. And that software ecosystem is going to involve applying calibrations to raw signals. It's going to be quality control, quality assurance, doing data validation with other instruments that we know are high fidelity. Uh, doing some dispersion modeling. So if you have uh, pollution concentrations at all four of those sites and you know something about the meteorology, what do you expect the concentrations to be in between those sites and just downwind of those sites? So doing some of that type of work. Uh, doing things like regime warnings. I showed you those three different regimes in that data plot. Uh, can machine learning approaches tell us we're in a regime in your area where we know there's a lot of these particles that are dangerous? and notify you about that, and tell you to close your windows, or tell you to go to a park across the street instead of the park that's next to your house. Um, ideally, what we want to do is, and this is the whole goal of the project, uh, go back one, is we want to we put this in your hands. So we want to create a mobile and web-based product that you can actually access on your phone, you can access it on your computer, and you can real-time look at pollution concentrations in your neighborhood. 
And this creates a feedback system that's not unlike Google Maps. When you're going to go somewhere, you look up directions on your phone in Google Maps, and you can see traffic. Uh, you're not going to take the route that has the most traffic. You're going to choose one that has a little bit less traffic. So our vision really is to create a way for you to have that same type of feedback with your air quality to reduce your exposure. And this is kind of a, a, a lofty, crazy goal, but we're going for it. And you're our, our test bed. And we're really excited to do it in East Boston and Winthrop. Um, yeah, go ahead. So our goals with all of this is to get that type of feedback. We want to give the exposure feedback the same way that you get traffic feedback in your Google Maps app. We also have a vision of, of shifting this mass port communication paradigm. So, I think one of the things you're talking about was um, was calling Massport when you have a noise complaint. Um, right now, the relationship between Winthrop and East Boston and Massport is based on egregious, really annoying, obnoxious things that are punctuated. It happens every once in a while. I there's a 747 that was landing and it had an issue and had to abort landing and it thrusted over my house and shook my windows and I smelled fuel and I called Massport. And they say, yeah, we had to divert a plane. And that, that's, that's always gonna happen. So that doesn't, that doesn't change much, right? Or, or it's based on anecdotes. We say, uh, all the kids in this part of the world have asthma. Um, well, what are you gonna do about that? So what we wanna do is provide the local community with a long-term data set that we help digest and we help make accessible for you to equip you to go to Massport with scientifically grounded, hey, we did our own measurements and here's what we see and we know from the environmental health literature that we're gonna have these problems. So let's sit at the table based on that instead of that 747 that got the ribbon. So we're after shifting that paradigm so that you are able to better advocate here in East Boston. I'm not going to do that because you work, but I do want to equip you to do that because you work. And the last thing is, is to provide an example. We think that this is something that communities around airports can do all over the globe and they're not doing. Right? So, and not just airports, it could be factories, it could be uh, any number of different sources. We want to set this up as an example of a, a local community can make a relatively small investment in the grand scheme of how much science costs. And they can equip themselves with data and with the ability to real time reduce their exposure to pollution. And we have some asks. Uh, we, we need you all in order to do this well. So there's some asks now. The first thing that we're doing now is, is we need your help setting up this network. And we need that help at, at three different levels. One of them is we want you to tell us what you want to learn about air pollution in Winthrop and in East Boston. Now keep in mind that we're not epidemiologists. We can't tell you if your child is going to develop asthma. We can tell you about pollution concentrations. And we can tell you about things like uh, different emissions from different types of airport activity. So that, that's kind of the realm that we, that we want to hear from you. So Christine has a bunch of note cards and a handful of pens. If you have a pen, don't take one from her. And we, we would love you to take a note card and write on that note card, what do I want to know about air pollution? And feel free to take like 20 note cards if you want. And we will sift through them and that will help us understand where we need to put these sensors. Because we will answer vastly different questions based on where these sensors actually are, right? Because that depends on um, different sources and, and things like that. The second thing is once we do sort of finalize the idea of where these sensors are going to go, we need your help finding specific locations. So if we come back to you in a month and we say, here are the areas where we want to put sensors, we want you to put your hand up and say, my friend lives right there. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say, you've got to put one of these sensors at your house. Okay? Um, 
So we need your help finding those locations. The ones that are up here, by the way, are totally examples, and that's not necessarily where we're going to put them. Um, so we, we, we need that help too. And that could be people's homes, it could be your workplace, it could be a school, it could be the town of Northwood property, it could be East Boston property. And then the, the last thing that you can do to make this a better project is to fund additional sensors. And this is more of an ask for the, the town of Winthrop. But the more sensors that we have in this network, the better able we are to map out concentrations in real time. Uh, so that gets better the more sensors that we have. We have funding enough. Uh, I, I own six at Olin, and I'm giving all six of them to this network. Aerodyne is, in addition to the funding that they're uh, providing for the project itself, they're going to find another couple of instruments and scrape them together and put them in the network. But any additional um, any additional sensors we get make it better. So that doesn't mean that the town of Winthrop says we're going to buy six of these, but it could also be plugging us into additional funding sources to, to make some of that happen. I'm going to finish the, the second bit of um, asks and then I'll, I'll take some questions. The quick question was the sensors, are they that little black box? The, that that tiny little really box. Yeah. I, should have brought, yeah, I should have brought one with me, but they're about that big. It's the, yeah, it's the little box that you saw. They can go on a telephone pole or on the side of the roof. But yeah. the, the second thing that's an ask is starting in September, we're going to have that team of five unnamed individuals that are faceless right now, that will have faces and relationships with you. We want you to help design the software interface with our students, because the software interface means nothing if you can't use it. <laughs> and so we're really big on user-oriented design at home, the idea that engineering starts with people with people, and then we come to you first to think about functionality. We go back, we develop some of it, and then get it in front of you. So we need people to help us do that co-design process with the software. And then we also need you to keep doing your advocacy work. We want to equip you with better information uh, to do that advocacy work more effectively, uh, but we need you to keep doing it. I, I am not here to try to partake in that advocacy work, but to equip you to do it more effectively. So. Those are our asks. That's the end of what I want to say to you. And I'm happy to take any questions. And please, as you're just thinking, write down questions that you have that we can answer. Yeah. Are, are you ready for questions? Bro? I am, yeah. Okay, hold on for a minute. Sure. Yeah, thank you, Scott. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to say for the benefit of the camera, this will be um, edited and available for viewing. And um, our town counselors will see it and get behind the project. So if you have a question, if you don't mind coming up and just asking in the microphone, um, that would be great. Dick, Dick had something. Yeah, before, before the professor answers the question, that's what the cons were passed out. I see our representative from the press in the back of the room. Thank you, Will. Uh, personally, great, great presentation, Scott. Here we have a professor. Here we have a professor for a fully accredited college, a private college here in Massachusetts. All right, they graduated their first class as I think they were in 1997, and I think the first class graduated in 2010. But we have a man that came down here, made us an offer. He made an offer last year. The airport was under construction. Came down tonight and gave us a little data. I didn't realize that we spoke about the Northwesterlies can be as severe on us for blowing things into our face as are the Southwesterlies that we experience in the summertime when the Southwesterly wind comes across. And that's those are the days you have to go out and wipe all the, uh, whatever, residue off of your white furniture that's outside before you sit down. But anyway, as I say, he is willing, he is a professor with a college certified, chartered by the Commonwealth of Mass, volunteered to come in with their, as a class project and take something on to give us this kind of data. Now we mentioned the recent environmental data report that was delivered in May. It's for the year 2016. It was delivered in May of 2018. That means, you know, a whole year has gone by. And he talked about there are a lot of data, there's a lot of data in that report, but there's a lot of items that aren't in that report because maybe they don't have the 
Well, I'm not going to say the knowledge. I'm sure they have the knowledge. They're, they're people that put those together. But maybe they, as usual, only tell us all half of the story. And I'm disappointed to see the side of the people we have uh, good advanced information. This is being taped so Barbara can have it on WCAT for the future. But where are our town council members? Why aren't they here to listen to some of this? Yeah, we may have to make a, 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 a concession when if we put some of this monitoring equipment. And it might cost a couple of bucks to buy it, or rent it, or whatever we're going to do. On the other hand, why aren't they here? So I would expect people like Dottie in Precinct 4. You're not reticent. Dottie, you'll talk to anybody, anytime, OK? Mrs. Cassetta from Precinct 3, I'm sure she's going to say, you know, I think we all have to get out to our precinct councils and say, hey, where were you? Why didn't you come? This is for free. A college is willing to take on a project like this to tell us what we're breathing every day. And everybody, you know, worries about, especially the young and guys like me, the elderly, okay? I'm just too mean to go. But the young, you know, we think about young families. And here's a man that can say, so I know you have some questions. You really do answer. I just want to set the stage that way to say, you know, Massport, yeah, they're, they're trying to be a good neighbor. Well, maybe we get some of this data and, and not such a good neighbor. Not by the end they're going to say, well, what do you expect from an airport? Wait a minute. We were here long before Logan Airport, okay? In the town of Winter. We want to keep it the way it is. But the main thing is, it might give us a bargaining chip when we renegotiate something uh, to help us out in the future. Scott, go ahead. I'm sorry to take your time, but I can go to to the committee. Do you think, because apparently we don't have a voice, we haven't had one in a long time, as, uh, as far as uh, Logan Airport looks at Winthrop, they don't look at her at all, okay? We're not taken seriously. Do you think that it would behoove the committee to approach East Boston's committee, if indeed they have one, and form a team because there's the old adage, in numbers there's strengths. Right. Each time you gentlemen, or whomever you send to these meetings, and if you're doing the onesie twosies, they're gonna salute you, they're gonna shake your hand, they're gonna welcome you again, the good old buddy system, and you're gonna go home and we have the same mess. Do you think you would consider, and would it be advantageous to the project with an eye on the future, if they were to combine that effort with Winthrop and East Boston, the two loudest voices, because when we had the meeting, last meeting, if you remember, Mr. Dines, they gave us a list. Winthrop was way down at the bottom with nine calls that had been registered. Now, that's not true. That's a false statement in its own. I'm probably six of the nine calls. So, and I mean, with all due respect, I respect the committee, but I don't think you have a strong enough advantage anymore. And I think by combining the efforts, along with the community endeavors, I think we could do something. Yeah, so the question, the question is about, is it, does it make sense, is it advantageous to <coughs> join forces effectively with East Boston? And I, I, I'm new. Mass court relationships. I am. I, am I, have a, I have a very steep learning curve. I've learned a lot in the last year and a half of being involved with you all. Uh, I I tend to agree. East Boston and Winthrop are exposed to the same types of problems, and I think you know. Then you start to think about well, Southie also has part of that really low altitude airspace. Uh, so does Chelsea. So, so then, who who else needs to come to the table to address some of the impacts? And I will say that in the scientific world, there's a lot of momentum around characterizing airport impacts. And most of that momentum. So, some of my colleagues at Tufts, John Durant, is is doing some of that work and is uh, postdoc in Lakshmi Hala. There, there's some at uh, Harvard School of Public Health. John Levy is a big name in that. Kevin Lane. There are, there are 
people studying this at an academic level, which is great, and it's, it's cycling in that funding to academics, and eventually something will come out, and they're doing good work, and they need to do that work. Uh, I think you all as a community can advocate for your own local knowledge, and I think you're, you're probably going to have a louder voice and a stronger voice if you do it together with other impacted communities. I'd like to answer, Dolly, if I may. Dolly, I would have no problem of joining Air Anthony's Austin in a unified effort. But I seriously question whether we could get our leaders in this town to agree that our committee, which is a town council appointed committee, to join with East Boston and get town funds. I think your idea is great. I've got a funny feeling that we would have to do it on an independent basis, but it could be wrong. Who's this kid? I don't want to Riley. I'm in uh, Precinct 5, and um, I just want to speak about the counselors, at least the ones I had been in touch with. Um, Email-wise, uh, Heather Raymond cannot be here this evening. She's um, counselor for Dottie's Precinct in 4, um, and she has a family commitment this evening. And I emailed my counselor, who is Pete Christopher, and um, Pete thanked me, you know, for letting him know about this uh, meeting tonight, and I did take it on to share it email-wise with a number of my contacts. But Pete says, sorry for the delay in response, but it was just an afternoon. I mean, that's how quickly he responds to me. I am sorry, but I have a prior engagement that night and will not be able to make, make it to talk with Dr. Hersey. Will it be taped? I would really like to hear what he has to say uh, in the topic. I think all of this new energy around the airport is great. It is also very timely, as we are going to be negotiating the pilot in a few years. And I think that's, I'm not sure what the first, what the P means. Is it program in lieu of taxes or what? Payments, payments. 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 thank you. Payments. payments in lieu of taxes in the, in the few years. The more attention we can generate around the health impacts the airport has on us, the more we can push back on a lot of the projects that have negative impacts on the community. I look forward to talking about it with the group, Pete. Um, and he also, I wasn't quite sure, but he reaffirmed that, you know, about the development of the parking lot, and then secondly, uh, expansion of uh, Terminal E. Was it Terminal E? And yes. uh, our chairman. Uh, I just, I just want to make a comment. I, requested that my secretary send notice of this meeting, as well as a copy of the headlines in the East Boston newspaper about East Boston adopting it, to the council and to the president. Mm -hmm. Just so you know. So it's been fairly well advertised. I, I just want to go back a bit, though. Now, this is rather interesting. I'm really glad to see the chairman of the Department of Public Health here. Bill. That's the department, just the board. The board, excuse me. Uh, also, Bill, Astrid is here too. Bill so Schmidt. She's oh, yes. oh, 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 Astrid. Uh, okay, Astrid, please. And Susan McGuire, third member, is on vacation. Okay, and she's vice president of the, department, of the uh, Board of Health. Um, yeah. I'm really happy nice to hear that. But at any rate, I'm glad to see that the Board of Health uh, is represented here tonight because I know, and I'm not a, a member of uh, the Air Hazards, but I was involved. Um, to get some delineation and, and knowledge about the APGAS issue and was in touch with Dan Wolf, who is the executive, he's the CEO of Cape Air. And I, I need to assure people that uh, he's, he's on our side. Here's, here's a, a man who was a progressive senator and he's also a progressive corporation person who um, has put his, his staff and his money into researching ways to modify the gas and get the lead out of the gas and then buying alternative planes that don't require the lead. So, uh, and, and Bill Schmidt and um, Don Cork worked with me on that project. But that aside, um, I go back to what Mr. Banks was saying, our chairperson of this committee,
about that. May 28, 19, 2014. We were all in this room to hear the Logan Airport Health Report that, as Mr. Banks said, took like 10 years. It, it was like insane uh, in an effort. And I remember that Senator uh, Anthony Petroselli at the end said, we need $90,000 to, con to complete this study. You know, and Massport will pay for it. And that's how we got that study, which now the data is ancient history because I think it only went up to 2010. Correct me if I'm wrong, Dick. But um, uh, we, in, in that room, uh, Suzanne Condon, who delivered uh, the address from the, the State Board of Health, from the State um, Department of Health, promised me that she would come back with data relative to the cancer rates mm -hmm. in Winthrop. And she said, I'd be more than happy to come back and talk to you on that. It was eliminated from, from the study. And her reasoning for that was that she said that she, she, she said that cancer, in fact, um, is higher in communities not adjacent to the airport. She also noted that there are many other risk factors associated with cancer, i.e. lifestyle issues such as alcohol intake, smoking, etc. I was still concerned, I'm saying, about the particulate matter causing a higher amount of breast cancer, which was indicated in one of the studies that came out in November of 2011. And that's when the then town manager enlisted me to help, you know, formulate a, um, a, um, uh, a, a community health assessment, and we did that so that we were eligible for grants uh, in, in the area, because Boston had done one, Revere, Charlestown, everybody, but we had not. So that's one of my questions, uh, you know, about uh, the impact on, on the cancer rate, and uh, I'd be, uh, like to know that. And, and at the time, too, I need to say, on, on uh, Heather Rangman's behalf, she was chair of the Board of Health uh, back a couple years ago. And uh, she also registered, you know, the, the same concern. And, um, you know, she, she wondered, you know, what to So I, I really encourage Board of Health to be working alongside your ass. Because uh, this, this is bigger than all of us. Um, and I, I know I'm forgetting something here, but there was uh, something. Oh, the fact is that I wrote to Suzanne Condon back in May of 2014, a month after, or no, like June, a month after she, she said that to me. And then, going through my files, I you know, we're trying to get rid of some things, and found on May 29, 2017, I wrote to both town manager Jim McKenna at the time and town councilor Heather Rangman uh, to say, have we heard from, you know, Suzanne Coyne? Nothing, nothing. So, and I wrote again in 15, I wrote in 2014 and 2015, her then President Gill's, uh, you know, sanction, and uh, the town wrote again to Susan Cohen, no response. So that's that's where we're at. So I'm hearing what Dottie's saying, and I, I really think in numbers uh, we have more strength. And I really encourage the Board of Health and the Hazards Committee uh, to work in conjunction. And if I could just say one more thing, the Air Hazards Committee, I have to com compliment. I mean. The, the likes of Bob Driscoll and Jerry Jerry Falvo and Dick Banks and and Dave, uh, just you know, we need new blood in here. Thank God, Dawn has has joined the committee. Um, Aaron, last name, I'm not sure. Murray. Okay, Murray and um, uh, Tina. Tina. Julia, Julia, and Tina uh, Wallers and Tino Capabianco. But if if anybody you know, would like to, to join that committee, please be in touch with any of those members. Um, they can certainly use your energies and your knowledge and your your strength right now. Thank you so much. Any, any other comments for Scott? Question over there? Yeah. Scott, <clears throat> I want you to ask him a question 
along the lines of what can Mass Court do? Um, because I think we're all pretty sure that we're going to find from the data, you know, that we're exposed to a lot of these uh, how to find particulates. Um, so what can Mass Court do? Is it a matter of technology for the airplane manufacturers to scrub the exhaust, or is it rearranging flight times, or what is it that Mass Court can do? Great question. Um, some of that answer depends on how much we're able to resolve the actual impacts on pollution concentration based on different types of activities at the airport. So, for example, if we find that a major factor in the pollution you experience in Winthrop is actually due to the tarmac-based transportation, then they can they can do something about that. They, I mean. There is a bit of a technology piece there, but they can be progressive in shifting all of that to electric vehicles. Right. You can put emissions controls, better emissions controls on those diesel engines as a very quick start. Um, there are things that you can do to shift the arrival and departure times and runway usage and things like that. So there are some runway usage capabilities. The other thing that Massport can do is they can help abate the issue that you're experiencing by helping you uh, put interventions into your own home. So if they're able to acknowledge, I mean, they're giving out a lot of money for soundproofing. Right? Not anymore. Not anymore. Not anymore. Not anymore. 30 years ago. They, they have in the past given a lot of money for soundproofing. <laughs> uh, this, this is why I, yeah, this is why I, love, I learned every time I came to you. Um, if, if they're going to expand, the, then you start to get outside the box. And then you think if they're going to expand a terminal and they're going to have increased revenue for the airport, then you can advocate based on data that they need to set aside some of, some of that money from increased revenue to help offset the impact on air pollution that you're experiencing in your community. And that can be done fairly inexpensively. I mean, there can be, there can be filter programs and this is actually another one of my capstone teams is, is working on an adjacent problem to this. So this is all air quality monitoring. I have another team that's working on developing a product service system to, you're familiar with MassAve, they come into your house and they have energy on it and they change your light bulbs. Uh, imagine MassAve for air quality. You have an air quality audit in your home. We look at some air quality data around your home we're able to get you access to reduced costs or provided by mass or air filters for every room in your house uh, to replace windows that are super leaky or to at least seal them up with weather stripping. Uh, so then you start to think about all these different possibilities that mass court could actually contribute to if, if they're, and, and they're reasonable in saying that we can't change the fact that jets have been these things. We can't. They can control some of the stuff that happens at the ground they can control some of the traffic in and out of Logan. They can control some of the idling types of things. Uh, they can control some of the air traffic patterns. But the thing that is the biggest leverage point in that system for your own exposure is what can you do in your own home to reduce your exposure. And that's something that they can very much communicate. Yeah. I wanted to say something also about the Mass Corps and the Board of Health and um, actually, Bill, the chair of the board of health, and myself, we went to the uh, to the uh, to that data report um, community meeting, the public comment meeting, and we were really surprised how few people were at that meeting in total. I just want to say that room was twice the size of this room, and it was maybe filled to five percent. And of that five percent, probably the half half of the people were people that worked at the airport, and the other half were community representatives. And as far as we could tell, Bill and I were the only two people from Winthrop there. Okay, right. only two people. And I just wanted to stress that community engagement and community advocacy is the, our only hope here. Right. And I think that also the uh, what what really I took away from your excellent presentation, Scott, was that. Location matters a lot in this whole thing. They're presenting data of overall emissions. That might be you know, of interest to communities like Medford, Milton, that are far away, further away from the airport, that are now really ramping up their community efforts against the airport because of the new flight patterns. They're much more impacted by noise.
voice and it, mostly noise. That's what people feel and hear, you know, that's what affects them. In particular, it matter. They won't feel that until 10 years from now, probably. But I'm just saying, it's um, for them, the particular matter might not be the most important thing to focus on. Their advocacy is focusing on other things. So Winthrop needs to really, really, really become a strong voice at the table there with regard to exactly this topic. And I think that's what, what impacts us, apart from the noise. The noise will be, you know, other people working on noise, and a lot of other communities are working on this. I'm not saying you should stop calling, please do not. We are not on any calling list. And in, in the report, actually, there's a list of the 10 or 15 um, communities that send the most calls to, to Massport to complain about noise. We are not on that list. We're not on it. We're, we're below the threshold that they're reporting in their report. And that's unacceptable. Unacceptable. We need to be more ad active. I know they're lying about the numbers probably, but there is still not enough. Because otherwise we would be on that list. Okay, so go to the meetings. They were all advertised, even in the winter of transcript. There's free parking, everything. This is we need to go. We need to go and speak. I spoke. I showed them on the map of my houses, which is very close to Don's house, in fact. I told them that my kids, who are 16 months and five years old, their first word was, other than mama and daddy, was airplane. You know, because that's the first thing they hear in the morning, the first thing, the last thing they hear when they go to sleep. And, you know, this is very important stuff. If we need to be there, we need to advocate for ourselves. And then, so my question for you is, you don't have to answer that right now. It's just something to think about. How can we, as the Board of Health, help you yeah. with your work? How, we can, how can we support you? How can we help you interact with our town, with our townspeople, to get this you know, project going and make it successful so we can actually benefit from it? We don't want this to die after the pilot. We want this to continue, right? And then the other thing I want to say is that you know we need to talk to maybe our public health system here, you know, local hospitals. If we can take your data and and combine that, correlate that with health data, and I think then it would be really powerful, right? Because stand alone, it's not going to mean a lot. I mean, it's going to say something about pollution, but I think what's really important for us is to know how is this affecting our health. Yeah. And so I think. There is some, you know, future, you know, correlation to be done with public health data, specifically to these areas where you're going to end up putting all your sensors. And I think we have a lot of momentum here. We can do that, and it seems like it's not very expensive to do. Um, I want to learn more about all the costs and everything that's associated with it, but I would love to help. Yeah. Great. With yeah. whatever let, me, I can. let me quickly answer that. And, and I, I appreciate your desire to help, and, and the public awareness piece, and getting people involved with the fight is a really tough challenge. Mm -hmm. and, and, and doing this type of community-driven work, I find myself doing community advocacy work as much as I do science. And one of the things that I actually started doing in this past year, we have a graphic design professor at Olin, Tim Ferguson Sauter. And he has a design firm made up of students that entirely works on nonprofit projects. And he's been working with me on air quality, awareness, and advocacy. So we put together this really beautiful and powerful poster campaign that we have plans of implementing in a community. So putting billboards up, putting posters up, getting bus shrink wraps uh, to raise people's awareness of ultrafine particles, of other types of air pollution, and their health impacts, and then to direct them to a website that we're making that tells them what they can do to advocate for their own health. So that might mean that there's an East Boston section that says, or a Winthrop section that says, you, you can get involved with your airport hazards committee. Uh, you can, in your own home, install a HEPA filter. You can do these things to uh, reduce your exposure. So that's something that we should talk more about. But then, um, Thinking along this line, there's one in the back that's. What is the cost of one of these sensors? And did you say that you had six? Wait, what's this going to cost the town? Anything? Yeah, we have, we have eight right now available to us. So I own six at Olin. Uh, Aerodyne is going to pitch in another two for the for the network, and we can get by with just eight. There's six thousand five hundred dollars each. 
Uh, anything that gets added to what we already have makes the network better, but is not necessary to make it happen. So I'm not here to, to say, here's the proposal, you need to buy 10 of them or it's not going to happen. <laughs> this is happening. Uh, if you have funds and the means and desire to make this network denser and more effective, then that's great. Uh, we'd love to work with that, but it's, it's not a big thing. Any yeah, I just was curious, will the sensors measure sound as well? They will, yeah. So they measure uh, a whole set of meteorology, so wind speed, wind direction, solar radiation, temperature, relative humidity. Yeah. They do have a sound sensor, so uh, I, I've not worked with a sound data before, but you should be able to correlate a, an aircraft overhead yeah. with a plume. That would be imperative because... So kind of shoot the uh, noise, uh, noise off. Right, so. regulations with death sure. well, They give you a hard time, right. And yeah. I have 30 to 40 minute conversations on almost a daily basis with Junior at Mass. <laughs> well, I might not have attended that meeting, but yeah. I'm in contact right now with Senator Warren and our Senator Bonfori, who I'm having more luck with Senator Warren, if you can believe that, at a state level, okay. uh, on a, a federal level. However, I believe people that are directly affected, our noise count may, I mean our complaint line count may be low because next gen is this new GPS tracking system. It's public record, everybody knows about it, the senators know about it, Massport knows about it. What it's doing is it has now narrowed the flight path. So it is the same people getting bombarded day after day. I wouldn't expect somebody who lived three miles inland, away from the point, to be disturbed by what I'm being disturbed by. Every 30 seconds, 900 flights in a row. It's debilitating. It is. I believe it. Let me, I'm going to just have two quick responses. Okay. The first one is that we do have sound sensors in these instruments. They, they are not high enough fidelity to legislate or to litigate based on. Uh, all that we can do is say, that is a big sound peak, we can correlate that with the pollution, but we, we will be able to do that work. Uh, the, the second thing is, um, you're touching on the idea of the paradigm shift in the communication. Uh, if they're not getting calls because it's the same people getting bombarded all the time, then you know the, the only time they get a call is when something egregious and abnormal happens. And so we want to shift that communication paradigm into here are the long-term patterns and spatial patterns that are impacting this whole community, rather than just those people that are complaining. Right. I mean, after 20 years in the same address, I noticed the difference. Yeah. I know when I sit in the same spot that I've sat in for 20 years, and I know when they're not where they're supposed to be, and they have the trajectory of the flight path has changed beyond belief. I mean, it's just, it's incredible. And then wind speed and wind direction is no longer a factor. No, yes. I was told explicitly that I can write down who told it to me. It has no bearing on runway nine takeoffs. Right. No bearing whatsoever. I just want to say one more thing with regards to runway nine, which impacts Winthrop. I was told by Massport that Runway 9 is the most convenient yes. and it will be used 24-7 despite wind direction. And I think everybody in this room needs to hear that because that's important and that's significant. Because you hold one of the ladies by the hand and put it on the way. Yes. This is going to be an independent study, correct? Massport is not in on no. this at all. No, the, the, this is an independent study. Uh, Massport is not a part of this whatsoever. The only people that are part of this are Olin College, Aerodyne, and, and Air Inc. Uh, so Air Inc. has provided some funding to make this project happen. Okay. And when we get all of the data, yeah. say in a year or so, and we can somewhat prove that it's detrimental to our health, we can then go and say to Massport, this is what we have, what can you do for us now? Or we'll sue you. Let me, I'm gonna, so the question is, can when we have this data, can we go to Massport and say, you're making us sick? You're making us sick. We, we're gonna yeah, come after you. 
So, so two, two things to answer that. The first is that we're not collecting any health data, so we won't be able to tell you whether what they're doing is making you sick. What we can tell you is what are the pollution concentrations but in space. But we can hire more people to take your report and then independently of mass support and put that information in and tell you what it does to your body. Epidemiologists, so on and so forth. Yes. Are there carcinogenic? The, theoretically, things? the answer is yes. That 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 connection point yes. is, is a giant, expensive one. That's okay. Um, we can and, ask what we'll pay for it. And, and the additional <laughs> the additional thing to add to that is that the low cost sensors that we're going to use on this network, when you go from a hundred thousand dollars, actually to to have a high fidelity research grade set of the same instruments that are in that six thousand five hundred dollar box. It costs you several hundred thousand dollars. You sacrifice something in the accuracy and the fidelity of the measurements in doing that. So what that means is that we are measuring pollution concentrations. They are pretty good and we've published data, so Evan Cross from Aerodon published a paper demonstrating that it's within a few percent of these reference grade instruments when we apply the right calibrations. Um, but we, we can't, these are not EPA standard measurements, and so they're not, you can't litigate based on what these sensors are going to tell you. What we can do is we can tell you a long-term climatology in space of what we're measuring from these instruments, and we can tell you within a few percent that those are going to be accurate. Right? That, that whole next step of, hey, we know that in the maze there are much higher concentrations of particulates, that step to, and those people have a much higher incidence of cardiovascular disease, I don't know if that's true. And that's a very long, expensive, difficult thing to prove that connection. What we can do, though, so we can tell you about those pollution concentrations. We can say, we know from the literature that those pollutants are associated with increased cardiovascular disease, and that is enough for you to be able to do something on your own and reduce your exposure to these, to these particles. Uh, you can also go to Massport and say, hey, we have collected our own data, you need to collect better data, and you need to collect data on the chemical composition of these particles, we need to get at, at really deep uh, NIH-funded work to understand those associations. And that's that's a whole other step that I, I'm sort of setting the stage for that with this. We need something very system. heavy to go to Massport and have them either A, give us money, B, yeah. give us uh, heifer, or give us a second yeah. set of windows. They're not going to just throw that at us. Yeah, this is you the know, Your data that you're going to give us and collect in the database, it has to be pretty heavy hitting for them to look at it and say, oh, okay, we'll give you money. That's a, that is a great point. And the, the sensor data... Because it's also going to affect our real estate. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, once you hear that, you know, when they're past this going on down the point, well, guess what happens to your real estate market? Yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, the data that we're going to provide would be heavy because it doesn't exist. You know, this is indicative data that is necessarily heavy because it's the first of its kind. Um, we're also going to operate some reference grade instruments alongside some of these instruments. So my colleague uh, John Duran from Tufts is setting a few of these up in different areas. So we'll have co-located data to be able to make stronger connections and, and, and all that. So what we will be able to produce with this network will be a very strong case to take to Massport to do more work and also to do something now. To say we're polluted. Yeah, to say that you're extremely polluted from specific types of activities and polluted in specific areas. Uh, and we need to do something about it now. So that's a point. Um, that was a good question. And so in that case, Scott, from what you know of winter, it, are there Areas that would that would be better to make this um, study deeper and richer, and like, can you see if a place on the map that you feel like you really had funds to add to this project that would really help make the case complete? Yeah, so that's, that's a great question. So, um, I mean, the first part of that is 
our network is going to be based on the things that you've written on your note cards. So the questions that you have, we're going to design the network around that. Also with our own experience of, of air pollution and remote. So we do know some, some stuff. We're not experts. You, you're all the experts of the airport impacts, um, which is why we are, we are coming to you first for these questions. I, I think there, there are some of these locations that are better than others. So for example, Oh wait, no, there's a new question. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I just want to say this is so eye-opening. Thank you so much. Like, it's, it's, it's wonderful. But I specifically want to ask you about the lower student IQ and, and performance for kids. I've never heard that before. Like, where does that come from? Yeah, that's it, And is that the noise or is that the particles in the air? No, that's a great question. So that was actually a study that was published on near roadway air pollution in a school. And that was an association between black carbon particulate matter, which is a specific chemical subset of particulate matter that is highly correlated with ultrafine particles and also uh, PM2.5 mass. And they found that after adjusting for other factors that there was a lower IQ in students that were exposed to those higher concentrations of black carbon. And that's, that's a study that came out in the last two years. So that's in Boston. Still, so. still pretty fresh. Yeah, that's that was Boston. in Boston. Do you remember what neighborhood that was? You know what, I don't right now, but I know Harvard School of Public Health was on that. And those are some of the people who are doing epidemiological studies in schools right now in East Boston. So some more data about what kids at least are experiencing specifically related to asthma um, is going to come out for You should put sensors um, in both schools. Yeah. For one format, one format, and one at the high school. I that would be very important sites to measure. Love the idea. That would have high impact because we, you know, we know the students are there all day or at least all morning. Especially with rallying the community. You could be like yes. the children in this town are being impacted. Oh, yeah. There's a sensor on the yeah. school. Like I think that could help. That was going to be my point to you was the fact that we're talking. I'm a senior. We have most folks that are of the age where we're not going to really see anything by mass board. Will be dead and buried by Caggiatis. We're trying to make it a little quicker than that. No, seriously, I was thinking if the chair would consider, because we don't seem to have the strength in numbers, would they consider doing something like this with the PTOs in the schools to talk about their children and how vastly important it is now to start to band together? and become more educated and become more aware as parents so that when the need arises, you can call on these people, you know, to, to have numbers as strength. And I mean, we don't have the strength in the, in the committee. We don't have the strength in the community. It's been pointed out repeatedly. So how do we reach out? Do we reach out to the parents of the children who are being affected for the tomorrows? I think that's, I think that's the best way. I, I do too. Because you have large numbers of we can, we can try to get public health data on these children that correlate with these, these events too, and you'll have large numbers. You won't have just one house of residents, you'll have a lot of people. Both of our schools, especially the elementary schools, have very strong PTOs. And I know if you present something to them, they will come. Yeah. All right? I mean, I'll, I'll bake cookies or do whatever it takes, <laughs> but I'm serious, okay? The other point I just wanted to render to you is when they put in the new middle runway and they um, changed the configuration of the input back a few years, we were blessed in the highlands. All of a sudden, we weren't getting that tremendous impact of noise. We weren't getting the residue of excess uh, fuel that was going on our cars, et cetera, et cetera. We hear it, but it's not the impact and unfortunately, it went to our good neighbors down the point. So the configuration of that airport has had a significant, yeah. significant change on the happenings in and around Winthrop. I just want to really quickly address the school question. I was just taking yeah. a couple of seconds. You know, our goal for this whole network is to characterize the overall impact for the area based on different types of emissions that are happening at Logan characterizing the impact of those sources, the location, and also how meteorology impacts it. 
if there is a school that's in a strategic location, we would love to put a sensor at a school. Um, if, if, they're, if, if they're not going to help us answer the questions that we're after, so, so that's where we want to hear your questions. Yeah, but just scientifically, much more. And, and exactly, but, but we want to hear your questions and we want to filter those through our meteorology and atmospheric chemistry knowledge and then design a network. And if, if there's no schools that are in that network, I, I don't want to make promises that we're going to put one in a school. Although I, I would I'd love to, it might not be the most strategic. And I think the data is going to be relevant to that school regardless of whether there's a sensor there or not. If, you were find, if them. your findings were as such that it was not strategically statistically uh, advantageous for the schools. But what about the parent awareness? That's, that's, there's two, two approaches coming together. Definitely, yeah. Yeah, and I'm happy to come talk to parents. Daddy, yeah. well, we heard that tonight gave a lot of food for thought in a lot of areas, OK? So we'll have the last one because I have to wrap this up. The last question is you said this summer, when are you going to be placing these sensors yeah, that's a great question. And then your students are analyzing in September. Yeah, the question is how soon are we going to start putting these out? That's a question more for Christine. Because I'm, <laughs> uh, so we're, we're right now uh, strategizing where we're going to put these things. Christine is going to be here in North Rope and in East Boston talking with a lot of people about the questions that you have. And Christine is going to do a lot of the work of, of helping us set the strategy. Ideally, by the end of the summer, so in August, we'd like to start putting some of these out. Uh, the network will be full blown in the fall, so into like October, November, and then it's going to be permanently deployed. So after we get all these sensors out, we'll start building all these software tools behind the scenes. That was one of the key elements around the, the whole issue was they like to make a school project starting at the fall of school, so they need some answers from a lot of people, and I'm disappointed that. We don't have some of them here, but we'll make sure they get the word. But as far as that document you talked about, the environmental data report, 2016, it's on the man uh, on the website. If, if you want to download it, it's 1,000 pages of data. And I got out a couple of weeks ago, and I said I won't get halfway through the damn thing to find out what questions to ask you. But nevertheless, the thing is, still uh, Professor Percy didn't come here bash passport specifically, okay? But he came for just to tell us what he's playing, what he has in mind. And I think it's a lot of valued information that's available because even though he said passport issues is a big, thick document, okay, it only went so far, which is nothing new with passport. I don't tell you everything all the time, okay? So it gives us food for thought to work on it. We are glad, we're happy to be here and asking these questions and writing them down. But he needs answers from the town of winter. Do, do we get involved or not? So we're going to have to get back to the council. So, well, I would like you to write an article, the paper next week, about how disappointed the chairman and committee members are that more people were not here tonight because I think we all found out a lot of information we've never been aware of before. And all we're trying to do is say, what can we do to try to the life and the well-being of the town of Winthrop citizens. But we need people like this to tell us, hey, this is what I can do, this is what I can deliver to you, and we need that support. So, we're gonna, so well, I don't care how strong you want to make it. I'll say I said it, but anyway, go ahead. All right, so anything else before we wrap it up for the night, Donna? A okay, brief one? Real quick, one, a brief? one is a question. Um, who is the contact person, or what's the information if we're thinking of someone who could use one of these sensors? Who do we contact? So if, if you're interested in getting involved, see Christine. Uh, Christine has a sign-up form that you can just put your information in that sign-up form. And we can be in touch with you if you want to be a part of that software co-design stuff in the future, then let us know. If you want to be a part of helping us set up this network and ask the questions, then let us know. I'm going to send up a follow-up email. Yeah. Everybody who gives me an email that's on this card trade, I have a notebook you can also write it down, and then you can feel free to email us as much as you want. We will give you all the updates and all the options. Um, yeah, I'm also going to leave a stack of my cards up here, too. So if, if, you need to, if you need to run, 
and can't fill out that form, just send me an email and we'll send you a link to the form. Anything else on these? Like, how much am I getting content done? Right there, a bunch of she can relay that up to me. Yeah, this is what I'm saying um, about mass orders. The information that came out of the May 28, 2014 Logan Airport Health Study, and Dick can attest to this, was that there's a high level of COPD among adults and a high level of asthma among the ch uh, children here in Withrop. Those two things were addressed and, and appeared in the Boston Globe the next day. Out of that came Massport working with East Boston Neighborhood Health to mitigate the asthma issue among the children of East Boston. I'm not so sure how much has been done here in Winthrop, but that's an example of what can happen when you have specific data, and we're hoping that maybe some of the efforts here tonight might lend themselves to that. They took out a whole page ad in the transcript on that whole thing about asthma. Okay. Thank you for coming, and uh, you know, we've been battling asthma for 40 years. Now it looks like we have to battle our own local government to try to get the name of the and get involved. Thanks. Thank you all so much. I really appreciate it.